Till Dawn continue on Channel 5 with Island of Lost Souls. Welcome to Movies Till Dawn, a new podcast that's a safe space for filmmakers to talk about the fascinating and exasperating and always unusual and never quite the same thing twice process of creating motion pictures. I'm Raymond DeFelita, and I'm the show's Toastmaster General. So I don't know how or when or where you stumbled upon this new podcast of uh, mine, but Movies Till Dawn is basically a forum featuring conversations that I've had over the past few years with legendary filmmakers, uh, all of whom I've been fortunate to count both as friends and mentors. Uh, I have interviews that I'm going to share with you, including Andy Garcia, Griffin Dunn, John Avildsen, Jerry Schatzberg, and today's uh, our opening two-part conversation, which is with the legendary Peter Bogdanovich. So this all started around 1976, when I was about 12 years old. Uh, the whole idea of taping conversations with filmmakers who I admired, uh, it, it happened because of the white pages. Uh, I don't know if you remember what the white pages were. You might remember the yellow pages, but the white pages actually listed people's home phone numbers. Uh, it was terribly analog, uh, and I was always fascinated just pouring through to see who was in the white pages. I, I was also really into old movies at the time, so I started looking up basically, you know, just randomly who, who were, what directors were alive living in Los Angeles. King Vidor, the, the, the director of the crowd and the big parade and uh, the fountainhead, it, he was listed. He had a Beverly Hills exchange, which was 275, uh, and I just decided, what the hell? Let me call King Vidor and see if he answers the phone. And of course, I had my little tape recorder with me, my little Panasonic, and he did. He answered the phone, and he was very happy to hear from a, a fan. I don't think my voice had changed yet. I, I know it hadn't because after a while he asked me how old I was and called me young lady. Uh, but it was a great conversation and it, it, I realized that these guys were still out there. They wanted to talk. Uh, well, some of them wanted to talk. The next one I tried was William Wyler, Weathering Heights, The Little Foxes, Best Years of Our Lives, The Heiress. He had a Malibu exchange, which was 456. Uh, these are in the days before the area codes were different in LA. They were all 213. So I called William Wyler and I got him on the line. This kind of German accented man answers the phone and I tell him that I'm a young lady who's interested in, in, in talking about his career and I tell him I admire his work and all of a sudden I hear wrong number. You have wrong number. And he slammed the phone down. So he didn't want to talk. Uh, but I also was able to speak with people like Ruben Mamoulian, uh, who not only was a literary film director, but also directed the original Broadway productions of Oklahoma and Porgy and Bess. And I wish I could tell you that all of this tape was preserved and that I could share it with you. But that the kind of cassettes that existed in the 1970s don't exist and play anymore. So basically, I decided to start all over. Um, and that's what brings us here today. And I wanted to tell you that because, in a sense, that's the way Peter Bogdanovich got his start, too. Uh, he began by uh, taping directors. He came, and he'll tell you about this in, in this conversation, he came to California at the behest of Harold Hayes, the editor of Esquire magazine. Uh, and he basically started looking people up in the phone book. And he found Alfred Hitchcock, and he found Cary Grant, and he found John Ford and Howard Hawks. And some of these guys were still working, but in terms of talking to them in a historical context, they were woefully underutilized, and Peter saw that. Uh, and you can read transcripts of those conversations in a wonderful book that he wrote called Who the Devil Made It. Uh, it's about, I'd say, 20, 25 interviews with directors from that era. Uh, and this was really Peter's start. You know, I assume if you're listening to this podcast, you don't need to be told much about Peter Bogdanovich. Obviously, The Last Picture Show, Paper Moon, uh, Nickelodeon, which is a wonderful and underrated film, uh, Mask, uh, they all laughed. He, you know, he's had a, a long and varied and wonderful career. And I've been really fortunate to know him personally and, and have had a wonderful uh, relationship with him over the last 20 years. Weirdly, it didn't start because of our mutual love for film, but because we both love the songs that are, you know, in the American songbook, as it's now called, the songs of the... 20s and 30s and 40s. And we used to get together. I play piano and Peter sang and we decided on a whim to record a CD. 
And we talked about movies, too, but really what we talked about a lot was music. And um, gradually we ran out of stuff to talk about once we made the CD, so there we are. Uh, we, we started talking about movies. And in this conversation uh, that I'm going to share with you, we talk a lot about John Ford. John Ford was a, a major part of Peter's life. And I think if anybody could possibly say that they had a warm relationship with Ford, or I don't know that any relationship was terribly warm, but Peter certainly had a close one uh, with the legendary Western director. Uh, so we'll hear some of that. Before I play part one of this conversation I have with Peter, I just want to uh, explain, uh, just because I think it's unusual and important, uh, where it was recorded. It was recorded in the basement discotheque of Brett Ratner's house in, in Benedict Canyon. Uh, th- this was a house. It, it's a wonderful old uh, hunting lodge, actually. It was built as it, and Ingrid Bergman lived in it in the 40s. And the... Um, theatrical and nightclub and movie impresario Alan Carr lived in it in the 70s and turned it in the basement into a disco. And Brett Ratner, for, you know, to, to, to be, is to be commended for not having re-renovated it. It exists as a nice little disco downstairs. I can't really explain anything more about why we were there beyond that. It kind of doesn't make any more sense, but there was something kind of charming about speaking to Peter Bogdanovich in the basement discotheque in a house in Beverly Hills. This is San Francisco, the city chosen by one of the most brilliant and sensitive new generation of filmmakers, Peter Bogdanovich, for his maiden comedy effort, What's Up, Doc? Starring Barbara Streisand and Ryan O'Neill. Any experienced observer of shooting techniques will quickly sense the utterly new and different atmosphere created on the Bogdanovich set. No more the crass showmanship and slapdash of the old Hollywood. Here, too, none of the catch-as-catch-can-do-it-anyway attitudes of former filmmakers. Print! Here, instead, is a skilled artist, sophisticated in his craft, using the camera as Heifetz uses a Stradivarius. It's funny because I saw the, the, uh, the Cabot show that you did. So it was you, Capra, Mel Brooks. Bob Altman. Right, Altman. And, and it, was, it was an interesting dynamic. Altman didn't say much because Altman hated me. Why did Altman hate you? Because I helped him. <laughs> With what? I don't even remember what year that was. It may, I may not have helped him yet, but when he, when he did... Uh, I had been offered, oh God, I had been offered to do The Long Goodbye by Raymond Chandler. And, and I said, I'll do it. Uh, but there's only two guys that can play Marlowe. So you got to get me either Mitchum or, uh, or Lee Marvin. And that would have been great. And they, said, yeah, and they said, well, the, the head of the studio said, well, the problem is we've already promised it to Elliot Gould. I said, Elliot Gould as Philip Marlowe? I'm sorry, I don't see that. Then they hired Altman, who had done MASH with uh, Elliot. And then I suddenly said, oh, I can see that maybe. He won't make it, a, it won't be a Chandler movie, it'll be an Altman movie. And I saw it and liked it. Meanwhile, the reviews and the whole way they were selling the picture was dreadful. They were just selling it all wrong. And I said this in my column in Esquire. I had a column in Esquire at the time. I said, I said it's not a Chandler movie but it's a good Altman movie, and they're selling it wrong. And they redid the entire campaign and put my stuff, well, the good things I said about it, in the ad, right? From that point on, Altman started calling me a Xerox director, which meant I just copied other people. And um, some, it reminds me of the story about the guy who said to William Randolph Hearst, you know, uh, W.R., that guy, Joe Dokes, he hates your guts. And Hearst said, that's funny, I never did him a favor. <laughs> <laughs> that's my take of Altman. I think, I think Altman, from what I know about him, and I, and I met him a few times at the Deville Film Festival, he, he was not, he needed to be the only one in the room. Yeah, right. Uh, and, and, I, and he was quite blunt about it. Really, which sort of was a, a little disarming in a way. He didn't, you know, it, it was just clearly was going to be his table, or uh, or he wasn't interested. But that's but that's too bad too. But I thought it was funny because he's very he's very tight lipped in the show. Mel Brooks feels like he's 
kind of like, do I, should I really be with you guys? Which is so unusual for him. And Capra is very, uh, he's very voluble. He's very, he's very interesting. I yeah, he was interesting. Yeah, he was. And then I started asking him questions because Dick didn't know what to ask him anymore. Yeah, he was great. Capra was great. I loved, I loved him. I, but you, don't, you never interviewed him. Yeah, I, not officially. But I spent a little time with him a couple of times because I interviewed him about Jimmy Stewart for the Jimmy Stewart piece. And I wrote, I, met, I wrote about him in that piece. About right, Capra, which was, is in who, who the Hell is In It. His, his autobiography, Name Above the Title, Capra's autobiography, yeah. was the, my first big film book that I, I Yeah, I think it was every, every, everybody's. It was a very good book. Yeah. He told, he told his life as an adventure. And it yeah. was very. It was also very optimistic. Did you think that that maybe he'd said it all in the book? Is that why you never did one of your one of well, your he, big pieces I talked, about I him? I talked to him about doing an interview, but he said he was writing a book. He said maybe he'd do it after he got the book out, but it was pointless. Right. He'd sort of said it all. Same thing with Walsh. Luckily, I got Walsh before he wrote his book, and he kept saying, "I'm going to write a book." Or, no, he he didn't say it. He kept avoiding me for a long time. But finally, because I knew Alan Dwan. And uh, he liked Alan. And Alan had approved of me, I guess. Well, these are uh, Ral Walsh and Alan Dwan are the two oldest directors you interviewed, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah I mean, Dwan was making films in 1910. 10. <laughs> and, and I think Raoul was making pictures pretty early, too. I remember Ford listed his, fav- his 10 best films of all time, and one of them was a film that Raoul had made in the, 19, in the teens called, um, I can't remember what it's called now. I've never seen it. The Regeneration or something. Mm-hmm. Raul was an interesting guy. I, I did finally interview him a little bit. I, I talked about his early years before he really got into pictures, Yeah, which was interesting. He, he was an actor yeah, before he was, a director, right. or maybe during. At the same time. Yeah. Well, he did um, Sadie Thompson, was his last thing he did in 1928. With Gloria Swanson. With Gloria Swanson, and he did it, he was going to direct it. And I can't remember who the producer was, but he said, Raul, Gloria wants you to play it. She, she, she had, couldn't have made it clear. He said, well, I don't know if I should play it. Yeah, you should, you should do it because Gloria wants you to play it. So she, he did. And he's very good. I've seen it. He's very good. One reel missing. This is, I think the first reel is missing. It's quite a good picture, by the way. As 1928 was like an extraordinary year, the last year of silent pictures. Everybody made a great picture. And Chaplin said... Just when we got it right, it was over. Hmm. It's interesting because I, I he made I've the noticed, circus. He made yeah, the circus. Yeah, that was his, and I guess the crowd. King the crowd Beaters. was King Beaters. The crowd. You can't get a better picture. Yeah. And Keaton made Steamboat Bill Jr., which is his funniest picture. I think absolutely his funniest picture. Yeah, it was a great year. And Stroheim made um, Wedding March, which when which when Sternberg edited for him. Yes, it's interesting because I've, I've often noticed that the last couple of years of silence. The visual, I guess, vocabulary was, it wasn't as sophisticated again for really a, no, a number of decades. It was very fluid. It was very... Very fluid. But interestingly enough, the, in the, in, I've noticed that in the talking era, the directors who started in silent pictures and, and made the transition into talking pictures and, and succeeded, the moments that you remember in their talking pictures are all visual, particularly with Ford, you know. But I think it's true of Renoir and, and um, Hawks. And they're all very visual. Well, I always thought it was interesting that, that Howard Hawks, and I think he says it in the interview with you, he was relieved when talkies yeah, he liked showed it. up. He, he thought it was an easier and more natural medium. Yeah, but he wasn't a poet. Ford was the poet in the, in the crowd. And he, he suffered. His first few talkies are not that hot. Ford. For it. Whereas Hawks' first few talkies are right away, he's there. Hmm. Except one actor in The Dawn Patrol, Neil Hamilton, is quite bad, very actory. And Dawn Patrol is early, that was 1930. Mm-hmm. It's a magnificent picture. Contact. This was the immortal Royal Air Force, whose gallantry thunders across the pages of history. Young warbirds, gloriously reckless, taking off in rickety ships to challenge the enemy veterans of the skies. Here is drama that soars with the courage of youth in a story that will write its message on the hearts of the world. Richard Barthelmus is so good in it. I think so much of Hawks' early work holds up. Scarface was was 32. Yeah. Lubitsch made the transition very easily, too. He just said, I'll do some musicals. (laughs) 
They're not talking, they're singing. You want to talk? I'll give you singing. And he did four musicals in a row. All brilliant. Yeah. And then he did one at Metro, which was the best one of all, and that one wasn't a hit because that was the year of It Happened One Night when everybody got very contemporary and very hip. Merry Widow, is that? And Merry Widow was yeah. his best musical, but it was period, and people went to Capra at that point. So I lied to you. Yes. I was playing your game. Nothing else. When I danced with you, I was thinking only of your medium. And when you took me in your arms? I was following instructions. Yes. And when I kissed you? That is the biggest lie of all. I feel like Hawks' films, early films, hold up because he was always actor-centric, which was not necessarily the case with most directors of the period. He wanted... He wanted to see naturalism. He wanted to give actors the, 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 he the, did. the push also, to be themselves. You know. Also, he came into si- silent pictures later than a lot of these other guys. He, 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 and he only made about six or seven, seven silent pictures. And none of them are that great. Uh, Fig Leaves is fun. And Cradle Snatchers is... The two comedies are, are actually the best. The, the, the more serious stuff is a little, little heavy-handed. But he just... Took to, took to the talkies like a duck to water and was way ahead. Lubitsch was the same way. Th- mm. Those two made the transition brilliantly. Ford, it took Ford a while to get get into, into it. You know? mm. But Ford was also, uh, and I, I'm sure a lot of it was an act, but he was famously cranky and, and difficult with actors. He wasn't necessarily there to encourage them, at least not in a normal sense. Or is that too simplistic? Or? It was funny because Wayne said that that Ford would, you know, was merciless with him when he wasn't in the scene. But when he was in the scene, he'd handle him like a baby, he said. Ford was complicated, you know. You know that story about, a great story, uh, when, he, when Ava Gardner came to Africa to do Magambo and Ford was already there. And he looked at her and he said, you know, I wanted O'Hara for this part. And she said, well, you got Gardner, so you can just shit in your hat. <laughs> and they, he loved her after that. <laughs> Gave her the picture. That picture is so slanted toward Ava. That's funny. Yeah. The minute she comes into it, it's, it's her point of view of Gable, <laughs> not his point of view of her. It's interesting how he did that. So he really was, in fact, actor-oriented. Well, I think... I don't know. It's, it was hard to figure out for it, you know. What, I mean, motivation. He, if, he, if, he, if, he, if he attacked you or if he made fun of you, he liked you. So he just had to bear with it. That's why he, he liked it when Ava talked back to him, you know. You told me about your first meeting with him. It was on, was it Cheyenne Autumn? <laughs> yeah, in, in Monument Valley. Yeah. He was making Cheyenne Autumn. And the... Uh, publicity guy and the unit publicist was, and I, he says to me, I arrive, Warner Brothers uh, um, knows about this, the studio knows about it, and I, I arrive with, with Polly. And you're, you're a journalist at the time. You're, for Esquire. Yeah. And <laughs> the publicist, the unit publicist turned ble- bleached white when he heard that, the, the, that my assignment was John Ford. So somebody hadn't told him, I guess, and he just started shaking. Oh no 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 no! He said, "I said, what do you mean, no no no?" He says, "No, he doesn't like the press. He doesn't like the press. You see, you see, now, now he's chewing that handkerchief. You see that he's chewing that? Yeah, that means he's very, very, very angry, which it didn't mean at all. He wouldn't introduce me to him. Absolutely wouldn't introduce me to him. A couple of days went by, and there was a weekend, and they had the day off." And I, I don't know, I went down to where the horses were or something. I don't know why I was there. But it was, Carol Baker was doing something. And her husband, Jack Garfine, the dire- director, you know, and, and Jack said, who, aren't, who, who are you? you know, I, and don't I know you? And I said, Peter Bogdanovich. He said, oh, yeah. He said, Haven't we met before? I said, I don't know. What, I liked the, your production of Ends of Man. He said, oh, thank you. He said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm here for Esquire. I'm supposed to do a piece on... Ford, but they, nobody introduced me. What, you mean nobody's introduced you? No. Oh, well, I'll introduce you. I'll tell him you're here. Probably nobody, he said, nobody knows you're here. So a couple hours later, sure enough, a jeep comes down from the hill where Ford is. McDonough, bitch! <laughs> Peter McDonough, bitch! 
And I said, that's me, I think. And they said, he says, the Admiral wants to see you for dinner. I said, okay, 7.30, so whatever, whatever. So I went up to the, to the hill with Polly. They put me right at his table. His table was long table. There were, all, there were three or four long tables where the actors, the leading actors, and Ford and the cameraman and a few other top people ate. Everybody else ate down at, down at the, where the, where the, where the uh, trailers were. There's about 600 trailers. And um, so he, I'm, they gesture for me to sit down at Ford's uh, right hand. And Polly sits next to me. And across from me is Carol Baker. And Dick Widmark's down there. And Ricardo Montalban and Victor Jory all sitting there. Ford doesn't say anything to me. At the moment, he's preoccupied with, her, with Carol cutting his steak for him. And, <laughs> and leave the fat, he says. You know, he liked the, ate the fat. Too. So I didn't say anything until I was spoken to. So a few moments later, uh, Bernie Smith, Bernard Smith, the, the producer of the, of the picture, comes in. He, as he's coming in to sit down, he says, you know, Jack, I think we could use a close of a carol in that last scene. Ford says, Pat Wayne. And Pat stands up. Yes, sir. He was sitting there. How much does he owe now? $2.50, sir. You owe $2.50, Bernie. Now, somebody explains to me later, there's two... Uh, Bowl, wooden bowls of money on the table. And I said, and the guy said, well, if you speak about movies, it's a quarter. If you speak about Ford's movies, it's 50 cents. <laughs> <laughs> I said, where does the money go? <laughs> to the nuns at the church down the hill. Of course. <laughs> so he turns now, after saying that to Bernie, oh, 250. No, really, Jack, I think we need a close up of uh, oh, 250, Bernie. He turns to me now for the first time and says, you know, there's a word for what he said. I said, what? Uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know what to say to that. I just said, oh, what was that? Govno. Well, I broke up. Govno is the Serbian word for shit. <laughs> <laughs> so he'd done his research on you. He well, knew he, that you knew, were he guessed it. I think he guessed it, because there's a lot of Bogdanovichs in, 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 in the Yugoslavia at that time, and in Russia. It's right. pronounced Bogdanovic. It's a fairly common name. And he probably checked, but I think he probably knew it, because he flew, as he said, he flew over Montenegro and Serbia a lot during the war. Mm. So he would have been, he would know what was going on down there. There's a word for what he just said. Yes, what is it, Mr. Ford? Govno. <laughs> First word he says to me is Serbian for shit. That's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> and, then, and then you had an encounter with him on the set, as I recall. Oh, that was a couple of days later, yeah. I was... Standing on the set, with, and, and next near the camera, was, he was by the camera, and there was a, a stunt man, Dean Jones, matter of fact, comes in a shot, comes riding down the hill, right to the camera, jumps off the horse. The horse hadn't even stopped, and he had jumped. He's already was off the, off the horse and on his feet, and handing a message to Dick Widmark, I think it was. And uh, Ford turns to me after he says, "Cut." Print, that's well. He doesn't say print. He says, that's well. That meant print. Cut, that's well. Uh, he turns to me and says, how about that? Uh, you know, <laughs> how about that? <laughs> what are you supposed to say? I didn't know what to say. I was, how old was I? I was 24. And I said, yeah, yeah, that, that looked, that looked kind of difficult. He got, he got such a disgusted look on his face. And he turned away, walked three steps, and turned around back to me. He said, I'd say it was difficult, yes. <laughs> I'd say it was very difficult. And then he walked away. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> Did you want to disappear? I wanted to, yes, it evaporate. <laughs> and uh, I assume the, the, the crew must have heard, too. He oh, said sure, everybody yeah. heard it. <laughs> I have to tell you, I was also wearing a hat, which he came to dislike. I was wearing a sort of leather hat with a small brim, kind of a New York kind of hat. Because actually, Polly had bought it for me in New York. And after a while, he said, you really shouldn't wear that hat out here. Let me get you a hat. And he got me a trooper's hat, which he put on my head and fixed it trooper style. And it, it almost fit. And I, I still have it somewhere. So I, I stayed away from him for the next hour or so. I just stayed as far away from him as I could, <laughs> feeling that I disgraced myself. Uh, finally, he does another couple of shots. And after one of the shots, he yells out, Bogdanovich! 
So I go running over to yes, yes Mr. Ford. Did that look difficult to you? <laughs> I, I, I smiled. I said, yes, it did, actually, yes. I just wanted to check for it. So I just wanted to check if you thought it was difficult. I said, yes, sir, it, it did see that. And I got it by then. So he was going to play. They played that for a couple of days. Was that difficult? <laughs> so he basically, he, he, he tamed you. This is what he, he did to people on, on, his, on his sets. He, yeah. he, he, he put you through it to, to, to make you subservient and yet also and to then make you feel closer to him because he, you had survived. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's that's absolutely, absolutely right. I survived. And I wasn't put off. I just you know, went with it. So then when five or six years later you, you, you did Directed by John Ford, your documentary about him, did, did you, how, did you, how did you pitch him on that? How did that come about? <laughs> I mean, that couldn't have been easy. Mr. Ford, you made a picture called Three Bad Men, which is a large-scale Western, and you had a quite elaborate land rush in it. How did you shoot that? With a camera. Well, first of all, we did the article for Esquire, and I let him read it. Before, it, I, before I sent it in, I, I had it, let him read it, which you're not supposed to do, but I did. He said, what are you trying to do, get me excommunicated? Because he swears, he swears all the way through the book. Like, Jesus Christ, God damn it, all that kind of stuff. I had that all in there. He said, take that out. I, I'm a ca good Catholic, a dubious Catholic, but a good one. And uh, so I took all that out, which he appreciated. And then that was in 63. It came out in 64, I think. By then I moved to California. And um, I told him I'd like to interview him for a book. And he agreed to it. Mr. Ford, I've noticed that, the, uh, that your view of the West has become increasingly sad and melancholy over the years. Uh, I'm comparing, for instance, Wagon Master to the man who shot Liberty Valance. Have you been aware of that change no. in mood? No. Now that I've pointed out, is there anything you'd like to say about it? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't... And so I interviewed him over a period of days, over a period of weeks. I come, you know, we, we, he'd put me off for a week or two, and then we'd do it again. I interviewed him for the book, which was called John Ford. That wasn't my title, but that's, that's what we called it, an English publisher. It was published over here, too. You were going to call it, I'd say it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it's difficult. <laughs> so um, that book came out in 67, and uh, then I, I, I think... We, we did an update in 72 or something. Like that. After, after he died, I think I, I did another, another pass at it. But he, he, I don't know if you ever... I, I let him read that, too. And he asked me to cut one paragraph in which, he's, in which he was taking the side of the Indians. It was very interesting that he wanted me to cut it. Why do you think he wanted to do that? He's so political. He was a big Nixon supporter at the time, right? Well, I don't think he liked him, but he supported him. Because he voted for Kennedy, but of course Kennedy was Irish, right? So uh, the, the the Irishness supersedes his. Uh, F F Ford was definitely an Amer a Democrat in the '30s and for early and '40s. Well, sure, he made the, the grapes of wrath. Exactly, and um, he changed somewhere. I guess I don't know. Maybe he didn't like Eisenhower. I remember hearing. Uh, uh, in fact, I think I saw it because I watched it a few years ago at his American Film Institute. Uh, tribute, Ford ended his speech by saying, God bless Richard Nixon. Yeah, I know, that was rough. There are some people in this world that don't think that we movie folks have any religion. But a glance around this, this distinguished audience is a living refutation of that nonsense. In a recent telephone conversation with the president, he said, what is your reaction to the prisoners coming home? I said, frankly, sir, I broke down, I blubbered and cried like a baby. And I uttered a short, fervent prayer, not an original prayer, but one that is spoken in millions of American homes today. It's a simple prayer. It's simply, God bless Richard Dixon. Thank you. What a strange way to end his, his, his Lifetime Achievement Award well, speech. Well, Nixon was there. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Nixon came and presented him with the Medal of Freedom, which is the first time an American filmmaker an American film artist had received the Medal of Freedom, which is the highest civilian award sure. that, that the government can give. Well, no wonder you said God, but God bless well, Richard that, Nixon. That's <laughs> why, you know, and the whole point was none of, a lot of people didn't like Nixon in Hollywood, and a lot of us were not thrilled. But it was, the, the attitude that was prevailing, because I spoke to Cary Grant, he was there that night, 
and Carrie's, you know, it's Jack, Ford, it's Jack Ford's evening, and he's getting the Medal of Freedom, and that's a good thing. Jane Fonda, the daughter of the man who Ford had made a star, was picketing outside. It wasn't, Nixon wasn't there as the president. He, he was there as the leader of the country giving an award to an artist. It, it could have been any president, is the point. And to, 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 to pick it against it because, because you don't agree with Nixon isn't the point of why he's there. Mm. So I, I, I didn't take very well to Jane doing that. Guess where I went a few weeks ago for the first time? Monument Valley. Yeah, I mean, there's really no other answer. What was I going to say? I got to, to Maine, wherever he was born in Maine. No, Cape Elizabeth. Um, how did you like Monument Valley? It's amazing. Isn't it, it? It's, it's stunning and, and beyond bizarre because you know it so well from the movies. Then you see it and it almost looks fake in person. Yeah, I know what you mean. But it, and it's all about him and, and, and Duke. It, everything about that place is... It's rooted in that culture. It's a, it's a reservation, and it, people show up not because it's a reservation. They show up because it's in the searchers. Yeah. Uh, it's in Stagecoach. Um, Stagecoach first, and then nine other pictures. Is that how many he did there? Yeah, nine altogether. When you when you look at the place, it's I, I can't imagine how the hell they got all their people and equipment and stuff out yeah, there. It it's hard. really, really rugged terrain. Yeah. It was a very rough location. It's still difficult to get in there. Well, I also took a harrowing uh, uh, a road ride. They offer, you know, rides in a four-wheel vehicle. And by the end of the day, you're just, you're sunburnt, you're nauseous. It's, you feel like your bones have been disconnected from you. I mean, I was thinking, like, well, how the hell do they do this with all the camera equipment and all the, the stuntmen? And the... But then I noticed I was watching uh, Fort Apache afterwards. Yeah. And... Most of the scenes are one take, so he kind of got in and got the hell out as quickly as he could, I guess. He, he, did, he was he was like that anyway. He just did one one or two takes, and um, if he could cover the scene in one shot, he did. Everybody who was any good did, really. Yeah, because you're an economical filmmaker. You're not noted for lavish spending, endless takes. It feels to me like you're most interested in these guys who knew what they wanted, liked to work sparsely, liked to... Yeah. Would you... I mean, is that something you feel like you were inspired by? In yeah, definitely. I, I, think, I, I remember hearing about Ford riding over Cahuenga Pass with, on horseback with his crew to make a two-reel western. Two, two-reel western means 2,000 feet, and they had 4,000 feet in their saddlebags. So that means they you know, they could get it wrong. They had two chances at it. Or two to one, yeah. And I think that's a good discipline. Also, Ford is right. I asked him about that. He said, why do you like the first take? He says, the energy is there when they start. And as, as you do more and more takes, it go, drops, energy drops and drops. And uh, you get that first t- time emotion, you know. And that, that's something, you, he's right. Actors will say they can do it better because they can maybe be more technically better or something. I remember Cloris Leachman when we did the, the shot at the end of the last picture show, the, the, the scene that won her the Oscar, because it was the last thing they saw. It was this extraordinary performance where she yells at the kid and all that. Mm-hmm. She kept bugging me. She wanted to show it to me. She wanted to let me do it for me. You know? And I said, I don't want to see it. And the reason I didn't want to see it was something I'd learned from Ford again, because Hank Fonda told me that when Ford was shooting, was going to shoot the goodbye scene from The Grapes of Wrath, when Fonda, as Tom Joad, says goodbye to Ma Joad and then walks across the empty dance hall and up into the mountains. That's a great scene. And Ford said, you guys rehearse it. Do whatever you want. I don't want to see it until you shoot it. And then so when the first time he saw it, when they shot it. And I did the same thing with Chorus. I said, I don't want to see it until you shoot it. Big emotional scene. I don't want to see it. The reasoning behind it is very simple. The director is the only audience that an actor has in a movie, really. And actors need audiences. And so if I'm the only audience, I don't want to have already seen it ten times because then she's a, she blown it f- f- for me. Mm. You know, y- you do a scene in the theater, you do it once, and then for the, once a night. Right. You don't do it twice a night. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing. It's that, it's th- that thing, you know that you get that you get on the first take first or second take early on anyway unless you can, unless they don't give it to you then then you have to keep going till you get it mm. but ford would go more takes if if he, if he didn't like it but but my way of looking at it is i read a scene 
before I go to make a scene, usually in the morning or late at night. I read the scene, and if I don't see any place that I need to cut, I, d I just say, okay, we do this one. If I see we've got to cut for some reason or other, be because we want to emphasize something or because it can't technically be done in one because you had to cross the room or something, you know, I don't, whatever it is, then I say, okay, cut here. Otherwise, I, if, if it doesn't, if there's no cut occurs to me, I just, just figure we'll shoot this in one piece. No, I know you to be f fairly uh, fearless with the one take uh, scene. With the one shot. Yeah. Yeah. So, I was on your set, and Owen Wilson was doing a, a long, very funny, complicated phone scene. Yeah. It was in She's Funny That Way. And uh, I was watching it on the monitor, and it was it was terrific. You did it three times, and then I was waiting for you to do the, the coverage. No, I didn't do any coverage. No, no, it was terrific. Oh, yes, that phone scene. We, we, we move in on him, I think. Yeah, yeah. He's talking to his wife. He's talking to the, the girl. The girl. It's very complicated. The madam I, and the... Yeah. I felt that would work best if it was no cut because it's so much business. He had to hang up on one, put the phone under the pillow, and I figured if, if he was going to really swing with it, it would be if I told him we weren't going to cut. Right. Because then he'd know he'd have to get it right. He did. He got it right, I think, almost right away. Anyway, about Ford, you asked me about the, the documentary. I did the book. I said, I, I gave him a copy. He said, how'd you like the book, Jack? Have you read it? He said, I threw it across the room. I said, oh, you like it that much? And that was that. That's the only thing I ever said about it. And um, it was a touching moment, though. Years later, uh, we did the picture, and we, everybody liked it. So I didn't like it particularly. I thought it could do better, and I did better years later. Like 20 years later, I did a new, new version of it. You recut the film, the, the directed by we John Ford. We recut it completely and did additional interviews. That's the, that's the version that's available now. Oh, okay. That's the only one that's available, because the first cut wasn't that good. And because the AFI didn't pay for any of the clips at that point, it, it was never shown anywhere except in film festivals. But the new one, which we did in 2000 somewhere, uh, Frank Marshall came, came in and produced it with me. Anyway... The first one was first shown in 1971, I think it was, at a special screening at which Ronald Reagan, who was then governor, introduced the film. And John Wayne was there, and Jimmy Stewart, and Henry Fonda, and Ford himself showed up. And um, we ran it. Now, as you know, it has some amusing stories that Wayne and Stewart and even Fonda t tell some amusing stories. But they were all terrified to go over and see him after the movie was over because the, they got laughs on at his expense <laughs> and they didn't know how he was going to take it. Jimmy said, I'm not going anywhere near him. And Duke says, I'm not either. <laughs> and Hank says, I'm not going anywhere near him. And I'm like, no, you want to go. So I went over and I said, so what would you think, Jack? And he says, good job on a dull subject. Great. <laughs> that was his official remark. And then... I stood there, and some people came up and said, congratulated him, and this and that. And, other. and finally, I said, well, I'll, I'll be going, Jack. Uh, and I put my hand out, and he took it, and he pulled me close to him. Very suddenly, just p pulled me right close to him, so his face was right close to mine. And he just said, thank you. Hmm. That was a nice review. <laughs> So that was the end of the first part of a conversation I had in Brett Ratner's basement, in his disco basement with Peter Bogdanovich a year or so ago. If you enjoyed listening to Movies Till Dawn, I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at Movies Till Dawn Podcast at gmail.com. You can access these conversations at iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, YouTube, as well as our website, moviestilldawn.transistor.fm. If you'd like to see some videos pertaining to the guests of each episode, please visit my blog at moviestilldawn.blogspot.com. And please feel free to follow me on Twitter at RealRDEF. That's R-E-E-L-R-D-E-F. All interview material and audio clips are covered by the Fair Use Copyright Act of 1976, in which allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, education, and research. Music